Finally, it is not that Rome didn't see the threats from outside. It really couldn't comprehend its undoing had already started from the inside. Now, you would almost think that Edward Gibbon, writing over 200 years ago about the collapse of the Roman Empire, was describing a familiar pattern in the demise of all empires. Bottom line, they never really see it coming. And what struck me perusing uh, his classic, The History of the Decline, The Fall of the Roman Empire, was how often Romans didn't see those warning signs. The masses that were increasingly revolting, the Roman soldiers suddenly not always winning. Given rights of Roman politicians who at first dismissed the threats from abroad, then tried to make peace with those who threatened them, coalesce with those who threatened them, work with those who threatened them, until they were literally overtaken and a lot of them killed by them. Too arrogant to see the threat, too cocky to think anyone could ever be a threat. After all, who could, who would challenge the empire of Caesar? Failing to remember that which was Caesar's was centuries old and a far cry from Rome's shaky present. Reading Gibbon again, it got me thinking, why does this stuff keep happening? Different details, same story. So much like today's American story and our arrogant dismissal of other emerging stories. Yes, the Chinese are the second biggest economy on earth, but they're a far cry from usurping us as the big cheese on earth. And yes, we need their money, but they need our money more. Failing to see that the spending that debases the U.S. empire now isn't all that different from the extravagant debauchery that debased the Roman Empire then. Now as then, those on top couldn't conceive of ever not being on top. People who refused to see that which they could not fathom. They were living the glory and the glory was gone. Empires have a way of never, ever, ever seeing themselves as anything but empires. And those struggling barbarians on the outside, not as legitimate threats to the throne, but at best pretenders to the throne. No threats to the throne. Until it's too late, and their throne is no more, and their empire is no longer. Just ask Rome, or Spain, or England, or us. For whom much is given, my friends, much is oddly lost. I think because those in power always, always thought it was a given. Newsflash. It never, ever is. Good boy, Neil. Good boy. I came across this Neil Cavuto editorial, which is a nearly incomprehensible pile of mush. What Neil appears to be doing is cherry-picking some facts about the classic tale of the fall of the Roman Empire, and as partisan pundits like to do, dovetailed into a lecture promoting the political themes they fancy. The whole topic is so ripe for interpretation because you can use it as moral proof of just about anything. Neil's gripe appears to be our quote-unquote arrogant dismissal of other emerging stories. Actually, it probably means the arrogance of liberals who don't watch Fox News to parrot the conservative narrative. Anyway, Neil sees our lack of support for his particular conservative agenda as causing America to fail to see the story of growing government spending for what it is, a threat to our future. His parallels are weak, but I suspect the revolting masses he references are his buddies in the Tea Party. What I find interesting is that Neil, supposedly Fox's top business journalist, doesn't mention one reason spending both under the Bush administration and the Obama administration went through the roof. It was to bail out Wall Street, big banks, and big insurance companies like AIG. The economic collapse they were responsible for is also causing government payouts to go through the roof for unemployment insurance to cover an unexpected explosion of people jumping to Social Security early because they need some income, and increases in demand for other social programs. Typical recessions and periods of high unemployment, tax revenues plunge. I'm reading the book The Big Short, which exposes the causes of the subprime mortgage meltdown. In a minute, I'll play part of an interview with the book's author. First, I want to mention reading The Big Short is a real education on the root causes of the mess. All the right-wing talking points blaming government regulation, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and bleeding heart liberals like Bill Clinton for pressuring banks to lend mortgages to the poor fall pretty much the wayside. It all started out innocently enough. Wall Street created bonds bundling subprime mortgages designed to reduce interest payments to the working class. This opened up Pandora's box with shady subprime mortgage originators offering increasingly poor mortgages to people that couldn't pay, but they didn't really care because they passed the toxic loans on as quickly as they wrote them. 
a handful of investors saw the time bomb ticking and figured huge money could be made betting against Wall Street. Most notably was Michael Burry, who coaxed Wall Street into issuing credit default swaps, a type of insurance protecting bondholders. It allowed him and others like Steve Eisman and Greg Littman to short the most toxic of the bonds. AIG, the final major actor in this sordid mess, was dumb enough to issue the credit default swaps because, frankly, they weren't competent at assessing risk. Maybe Neil's lectured on this topic, and I missed it. But any lecture on our current economic woes and government deficit isn't complete without that topic being included. Curious, Neil forgot to bring it up. When the stock market tumbled and major financial institutions collapsed in late 2008, it was a surprise and shock to many Americans. But for a few people deep inside the world of mortgage-backed securities and complex derivatives, it was just what they'd expected and even bet on. Some of their stories are told and the larger financial drama explained in The Big Short. The author is Michael Lewis, a journalist and writer. Well, uh, I was, it, it was, first, it was a fantastic story that I couldn't believe hadn't been told, that the, the financial world had essentially, between 2005 and 2007, organized itself around a giant bet. And the entire financial system, but for a few, were on one side of the bet. They were, they were betting on the subprime mortgage market. And on the other side were a handful of people who sort of saw what was happening. What did they see? What did they see that everybody else didn't see? They saw, different people saw different things, but they saw the corruption of, of lending standards in, in, in the subprime mortgage market. They saw the corruption of the ratings agencies that led to bonds that should never have been rated being rated AAA. They saw, they saw, the, they saw the investment banks, the large Wall Street firms, which had always kind of been the smart money at the table, becoming the dumb money at the table. I mean, it, it, historically, the last thing you wanted to do was be on the other side of a trade of Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs. They saw that, that, that actually there was a trade to be on the other side Suddenly of it. It made, made sense. good sense. It huh? made good sense. Yeah. And so, but, but um, the characters were so rich. I, I mean, and what I'm writing is a narrative. It's, a, it's, not, a, it's not an editorial. And, and the characters are sort of the oxygen for any narrative. So they, they led me to this way of explaining the crisis. There are a number of characters. Just tell us about one. Like Steve, is it Eisman? Steve Eisman. Eisman. Eisman was one of the first two or three original analysts of subprime mortgage originators back when they, when they were first kind of invented as an idea in the 90s. And he had come to see this interface that was growing between Wall Street and middle and lower middle class America. And it's a different interface than, you, I mean, Wall Street is usually involved in America's assets. You know, it's, 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 it's stock market, market decisions. This was Wall Street getting very involved in people's debts. And he saw th this relationship very cynically. In fact, he starts his life on Wall Street as a kind of conservative Republican. And by the time he's done, he's almost a socialist. Uh, and, you, and, and it's because he sees essentially the systematic exploitation of people who are, who are on the other side of Wall Street's trades. You know, but what's funny, though, I mean, they're the heroes. He and the others are the heroes of your book. They're not real heroes. I mean, they're, they're, they're doing this to make money. <laughs> yes. They make a lot of money betting against these institutions, but essentially betting against the U.S. economy, in a sense. Yes, they're not real. They're, they're complicated heroes. Yeah. I mean, they're heroes in the sense that if everybody had seen the world as they saw the world, this crisis never would have happened. And they wouldn't have gotten rich. And, and they wouldn't have gotten rich. And, and they, uh, they're also, you know, in each case, they did sound alarms. I mean, they were screaming to high heaven that this was what was going on was crazy. I mean, one of the characters actually bothers to go to the SEC and try to explain to the SEC what they think is kind of a fraudulent rigged system. So, you, so in that sense, too, they were, they were useful citizens of the republic. But it's true. It's a very curious tale where the, in which the heroes are betting on the collapse of the financial system. Now, now, now. I think what people still, what, you know, still debate here, I mean, what unfolds through their story and their discovery is, and you've just said, this sort of uh, greed, uh, corruption, uh, venality, uh, everybody is sort of gaming the system. <laughs>